33 people died uh, in those fires. We had 3,000 homes damaged and a huge part of the country burned. Um, so this is a significant problem for us. With climate change, it's predicted to only get worse because the temperature is going to be hotter, our heat waves are going to be longer, vegetation is going to get drier, and we're going to have more fire. Um, another thing that's different about Australia is we don't have a policy of forced evacuation, so the authorities cannot come in and say, you must leave. They can advise you to leave, but they can't make you leave. So there's a shared responsibility between the government and the, the people who live in places um, to take management actions. Um, and so for that purpose, timely and accurate information is really important. In the 2019-20 fires, um, for the first time, they, uh, issue, a fire management agency issued bushfire prediction maps as opposed to bushfire warning maps. That's what you see here on the right-hand side. Um, they were doing that uh, by the seat of their pants on the fly. The map design changed over the event, um, and they recognized at the end that they needed to have a better idea of what to do and how to be nationally consistent with this. So this is what our project is basically aiming to do. So our research aims were to understand um, how people are, are understanding current maps because we don't want to have a new map that is confusing uh, in conjunction with existing maps. Um, we wanted to understand how those maps uh, communicate risk and support complex decision making during bushfires. Um, and we wanted to be able to inform an ev evidence-based standard about how we should communicate this stuff to the public. So our research questions uh, in this part of the study that we were uh, aiming to address were what are the ways that people interpret risky areas from simple and complex bushfire maps? How do these map, uh, how does the comprehension of these maps actually influence uh, their interpretation of risky areas and decisions to take pr protective actions, um, or really um, their intentions to take protective actions? So uh, in the bigger study, uh, we had three study sites um, in these three states, in New South Wales uh, and the ACT. So that was a fire that crossed jurisdictions, um, one in um, Victoria and one in Tasmania. So they were all within the last four years because we wanted people, to, our, our respondents are people who had recent bushfire experience within those the past four years. Um, and so we chose these events uh, in these locations uh, to study people. And they also were purposively sampled because we wanted states with different capabilities in terms of their fire mapping uh, production capability. So we did 60-minute interviews. Um, there, there were two parts. One was about people's actual experience with bushfire maps, how they use them. Um, and the other one, we showed them examples of bushfire maps and asked them to interpret them for us uh, in front of us. So really, that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, that, that comp uh, component of the study. I'm only going to tell you a little bit of the results uh, because I don't have time to do more than that. So I'm focusing on the Victorian results. Um, you can see that it was a fairly gender balanced sample. We did have sort of, um, we didn't, we had a hard time recruiting young people to participate in this study. Um, so our, our age sample skews uh, older. Um, most of them had quite a bit of fire experience with three or more fires. A fair number of them um, either worked in emergency services. Um, our, our bushfire um, Fighters are mostly uh, volunteers, so they're community members. So a lot of them um, in these areas are part of bushfire brigades, um, and more than half of them are daily map users. So this is the first map we showed them. It's a very typical map from our um, Vic Emergency platform. You can see that there are two warning polygons here. Um, one is this red one, another is an orange one. This is the emergency warning. This is a watch and act area. So when we asked people what was catching their attention, um, they said that these, these two polygons, and in particular the red, was what caught their attention. Um, they said things like, uh, oh yeah, that means take shelter. Uh, it's too late to move. Um, that's a leave now. Uh, get on the other side of that line. Um, they said things like, it seems to suggest that there are two distinct areas of risk here. There's one that's bad. The other one is not quite so bad. Um, a few people didn't know what those polygons meant. Um, they were looking for the legend. You can actually get to the legend, um, this button here, Icons Explained. It's really a difficult legend to interpret. Um, so it's also kind of hidden. A lot of people won't see that. So 31% um, of them actually said that those colors were too uh, similar for them to tell apart. And when you zoom in, look at that. Do they look different to you? Not really. They look OK if they're opaque. When you put transparency on them and you have varying things happening in the background, they're actually very difficult to tell apart. Um, so you know, you, this is reflected in this quote that you see here on the screen. 
pride. Um, they were also a bit unsure about what those fire icons meant. Um, they didn't really know if the location was meaningful or if it wasn't meaningful. Um, so this was also a problem with the interpretation of those maps. Right? Um, so we found some particular comprehension problems. So first of all, this inability to tell apart the two colors. People being unsure about the warning levels, not being able to differentiate the colors, and the polygons were a bit ambiguous to them. They didn't know what the polygon meant. Um, some people um, interpreted the icon as being the location of the fire. In fact, it's not. It's just the centroid of the polygon. Um, so the fire may or may not be in that, actively burning in that area. Um, they were, this person was unsure what the colors meant. They did get the fact that darker colors probably meant higher risk, but they also thought that the area right near the orange triangle would be dangerous. Another person thought the area of highest risk was this township, Crestwick, which is underneath the, the orange polygon. Um, they actually thought the orange icon meant a fallen tree, which I'm not quite sure how they got that. Um, there's no tree in that icon at all. Um, they had trouble with the colors, um, and they really used the warning text that accompanies these maps um, really to understand what was happening, not the map. So they clearly were not getting the map. And then we had some cases where people were actually totally misinterpreting the map. Um, in this, this example, they thought that the triangle meant what was communicating the, the containment status of the fire, which is not correct. They thought that the polygon was the fire extent. Uh, they thought that red meant an active out of control fire. Um, orange meant that it was burnt and under control. In fact, the fire is going in the opposite direction of what these arrows are going. That's what they think the arrows show the way they think the fire is going. So they have completely misinterpreted this event and would likely take a very um, maladaptive action uh, as a result. Okay, this is the second map we show them, the complex map. This is in fact a map that was issued in the 1920 fires. It is a prediction map, uh, slightly different to the one I showed you uh, earlier. Um, the area of risk here is this big black line, um, which was very confusing to people. They actually thought that was a geographic border because it also for follows the border of the state, um, which of course the risk extended into the next state. In fact, fires were burning across that border. Um, so a lot of people did not comprehend what that black line meant at all. Um, so it was accompanied by this text that sort of tried to explain to them what this zone was. Um, and you know a legend that said potential impact zone. Um, but they said things like, I don't know what that black line means. Is it Gippsland, which is a subregion of the state? They said, is that the definition of Gippsland? I don't know what that's doing. Uh, another person said, I'm assuming that that's the Victorian border. The fire's not going to stop just because of that nice big straight line, is it? <laughs> right? Um, less than a third, of the, uh, a third of the people associated the black line with the area at risk. So that's pretty poor performance. Um, many people were very confused um, because there was also this, these fire icons, right? Um, which A, are problematic because they don't use the same colors, or they use some of the same colors as the warnings, but they mean something different. Um, so in this case, red is an active fire. Uh, yellow is a contained fire. Uh, blue, which doesn't look very blue on that legend because it also doesn't match the blue of the symbol in the map, so another problem. Um, <laughs> So people were very confused by this because they looked at this black line and they said, well, why are, why are those areas with red fires, so these ones here, why is that not in the zone, right? They, they were very confused by that. Um, so also the legend didn't match properly, right? Um, and they just didn't understand um, what was going on with this. Um, furthermore, um, you know, they had these areas that the, 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 the hash area is a burned area, and they were like, is, is the fire done or not done there? It was not clear to them. Um, so this uh, image really sort of <laughs> captures a little bit of what people were saying about this area that I'm showing to you on the map. So there's a lot of confusion. They're bringing the knowledge that they have about fires and fire behavior. They're looking at the map. They're looking at the base map. They're finding out things from the base map about what is there in that place. That's also informing their understanding of the fire risk. Um, and they're seeing a lot of conflicting cues, basically. So um, this map <laughs> had, had a lot of problems, to say the least. Um, the, the important information 
information that they were bringing to understanding this map were things like the accessibility of roads in that area. How many roads are there? How do the roads connect? Can you get out of that area? That influences whether they feel like they're at risk in a particular place or not. Fires joining together. Um, in that black area, it's not one big contiguous area. It's patchy because fires were burning into each other. Um, and they had some knowledge of the challenge of fighting fires in these areas, which are very dense vegetation in many cases, very steep terrain, difficult to access. So in summary, what did we find? Um, the red features are definitely interpreted as dangerous locations of high risk, so that's good. Um, but there were a lot of ambiguous symbols and missing important information. People, people wanted information like wind conditions, active fire locations, fire direction to inform their understanding of risk. When they don't have that information, they make inferences on their own. They may or may not be correct. In some cases, they are very incorrect and could lead them to taking very maladaptive decisions. Um, and these interpretations influence not just their judgments of where places are risky, but also where they could go for safety. So this is also important. We have some limitations of the study um, related to the representativeness of the sample. We had limited participation of people, younger people and less educated response, respondents. Um, so that's something that we, we need to take into account. Um, a lot of people did have a lot of experience of fire being um, part of fire part of the fire services. Um, we were testing here static versions of maps, not interactive versions of maps. Um, so with the interactive ones, people can drill in and get more information. Um, and also the context of the study. These were, no, uh, for obvious reasons, we can't do that kind of thing. We can't study how people are using these maps while they're using them in a bushfire. But we should keep that in mind. So what are the implications here? Um, base map choice is important. We need to understand what they're looking at in terms of place names, landmarks, road names, all those things, because they're using those to self-localize their risk. When information is missing, respondents look for that information elsewhere from other maps and other sources. They fill in gaps from their own experience, and sometimes that experience is not correct. Missing information includes things like fire predictions or spread direction, fire locations, weather forecasts, the scale of the event, and the scale of the response to the event. So information that we should include on these new fire prediction spread maps um, are the predicted direction of the fire spread, the fire front information, the problem with that is we often don't have it, um, burned areas, so which areas are already burned. Um, there's a big question about how can we show the uncertainty of these predictions. They are very uncertain. Um, if the weather changes, the fire will move. Um, so we need to sort of understand how we can communicate that effectively um, and which of these methods are best understood and lead to appropriate action. Um, so the future research that we are now embarking on is a set of three empirical studies uh, that will look at these fire prediction maps. I'm showing you a few of the examples of things that we're going to be testing. We're going to be looking at the role of the base map, how people self-localize, influence of temporal granularity of the prediction, comprehension of the text that accompanies it, and the role of interactivity on self-localization. So with that, I'll take questions uh, and acknowledge um, all the people who helped on this research.